This is so goddamn dumb. Please come back to the change room. Chair, please come back to the change room. I thought, oh, wait. Okay, so, um, uh, all right, I'm gonna tell you a story. Sit down. Sit down. I'm gonna tell you this. Um, I'm gonna tell you this story, and every word of it is true, I promise you. So, in the 1960s, Sonny and I were very famous, and, yes, and then our career just took a nosedive and we had no money and we had no job and we owed the government $278,000, like you do. And uh, so son said, we're going to have to do something different. You're going to put on a gown and I'm going to put on a tux and we're going to play dinner theaters. And I thought that was good even though I wasn't sure what dinner theaters were, but I thought, you know, velvet ropes and long gowns and limousines and that really wasn't what we did. Uh, Ours were more like if strippers, strippers and hookers and, you know, it was terrible, you know. It was more like high sailor in town. No, it was really <laughs> awful. And, um, and the first place we played was um, Elmwood Casino in Windsor, Ontario. And, and you, know, you guys don't come from there. All right, anyway. So, bless it's cotton socks. All right, but um, we played two shows a night, um, seven nights a week, and the dinner show was not too bad because the people were eating, you know, and so it was like eating, eating, eating. Oh my God, they suck, eating, eating me. <laughs> and then, but the midnight show was um, alarming because when the four people showed up, it was, uh, they hated us, and, and we'd been used to seeing like big, in front of big crowds, and now we're playing for four people who don't like us. So I just, I always thought the drunker they get, the more talented we will seem. But that didn't work out. So anyway, so, um, so yeah, it didn't make any difference how drunk they were, they hated us. So one night I just kind of got pissed off, and I turned my back on them, and I start to, make jokes with the band, and the band started laughing, and then Sonny thought that was hysterical, and so Sonny started laughing. And then, I don't know, did you see the Sonny and Cher show? Okay, so, um, the monologues that you used to see at the beginning of that show were ones that we made up on the horrible stripper hooker <laughs> burlesque places. So anyway, when Sonny and I parted, I started doing it the same way since it was the only way I knew how. You just say something and it's funny and you keep it, or if it's not, you don't. But then I thought, uh, I don't feel like doing it this time. And so I had an idea that I would tell people about the night, well, about the two nights it took me to turn 40. <laughs> By Cher. Okay, so it was the night of May 19th, and I was with my best friend Polly, and um, we, were, we were at my favorite club, Heartbreak in New York, and we were sitting on these banquettes, you know, like red leather banquettes, and they kind of go round, and then there's a table, and I was really pretty excited and happy, and, and even though I was 40, I was still 
feeling pretty happy and excited. But um, my dress was up to here, my shirt was down to there, and all I could keep thinking was, oh my God, you're so old and you're still so hot. <laughs> I was a very superficial 40. So anyway, well look, I was about to make a movie with Nicky Cage and he was 21 and I looked better. Okay, so Polly and I were just sitting there and just, I was daydreaming and watching people dance and then I was looking over and I was thinking, oh my God. And I'm going to Polly, Polly, Polly. Every woman is going to understand what I'm about to say. Polly, don't look now. But over my right shoulder is the cutest guy I have ever seen. And Polly gets off of the thing and she goes, where? Which one is he? Oh my god, he's cute! And I hit her. I actually punched her really hard. So, his name was Robert Camelletti, and that's a different thing altogether. So we flirted all night, but nothing really came of it, and I got bored and I went back to my hotel. My friend had this fabulous, fabulous hotel, and he was letting me stay there. And my friend had just gotten out of Jail is the short time and prison is the long time. He'd just gotten out of prison. And, um, like you do. And, uh, it was for tax evasion. He was a lovely man. Anyway, so he owned Studio 54 and he's just fabulous. So I went to sleep that night dreaming fabulous dreams of being 40 and then in the morning my telephone rang and there was a man named George Miller. And he was the director of uh, Witches of Eastwick, but please don't clap. Nah, -uh -uh. just trust me, trust me. And he said, hi, Cher, it's George. And I said, hi, George, how are you? And he said, fine, but I just wanted to call you and tell you that I don't want you in my film. And that Jack and I, Nicholson, think that you're too old and you're not sexy. Yeah. I was crushed because I wanted that movie so much. And, um, and I don't know, I didn't want him to know, but tears were streaming down my face, you know, but I just thought, I'm not gonna let this asshole get the better of me. So, <laughs> this is the way I tell him. Okay, anyway, usually in Hollywood, if someone um, insults you, they get off the phone. But he's from Australia, and obviously they just don't do that, because he kept going, I don't like your face, and I don't like the way you walk, and I hate your laugh, and blah, 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 blah. And finally I said, okay, look, mother. <laughs> you didn't find me under a rock. I was nominated for Silkwood. I won the Cannes Film Festival Award for Mass. So, so click. But the tears are still streaming down my, my face and, and I wasn't sobbing, but they were just coming like that. And then all of a sudden I thought, oh my gosh, these are fabulous tears. These are amazing. These are the ones you pray for. Actresses pray for these kind of tears because you're not having to make a squinchy face and they're just coming down. And if you look this way, you kind of look like a Madonna. <laughs> not the blonde one, but... So um, then I was talking to myself and I thought, you're crazy, I'm not talking to you anymore. And at the moment, my kids came in with bell, two bellmen and they had a big cake. And they were singing, you know, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear mom, happy birthday to you. And then they looked at me and then they said, um, mom, you're crying. Why are you crying? And I said, because, um, because, when you are a lady and you get to be a little bit older, not old, just a little bit older, and something happens that you are so happy about and you, you just don't know how to continue happiness and you just cry from happiness. And they went, okay. And I went, okay, now go along, we'll have the cake later. Oh. All right, oh hell, I forgot something. Okay, I always kind of come here when I forget that part. Um, so I was staying at my friend's fabulous hotel, and, um, and I owed him $28,000 and I didn't have it. Okay, I have one more place to go because I forgot something bigger. 
If I forget one more thing, I'll be sitting with you guys. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is not gonna make sense, but I promise if you just hang in with me, it will in just a few moments. So, since they'd started the David Letterman show, they had always wanted me to come on and I never wanted to do it. There. All right. <laughs> so three days before my birthday, the producer of the Letterman show called and said, how would you like to spend your birthday with Dave? And I went, oh, I would love to for $28,000. And he said, oh, well, we don't do that. And I said, well, then neither do I. <laughs> so anyway, he called me back in 20 minutes, and he said, oh, okay. And I was like, choo choo. <laughs> and um, when we were on the telephone, he said, okay, sure, please, just be honest with me. Why haven't you ever wanted to do the show? And I said, well, because um, David's very smart, and he's very funny, but if he gets someone on the show that he doesn't like or doesn't think, it up to par to him, he can be kind of an asshole. And so the, the producer agreed with me, and we hung up. <laughs> so the night of my birthday, I went there, and not looking real good. I don't know what that choice was, but whatever, it's over. Oh, it's hot, it's a thousand years ago. Um, so anyway, I go and I sit down, and he's sitting in this chair, and he's being funny, and I'm sitting here, and I'm being funny. He's sitting here, and he's being funny, and I'm sitting here, and I'm being funny. And then he says to me, so tell me, Cher, why haven't you ever wanted to be on my show? And I, my head exploded because you couldn't say that word or any of those words back in the day. And I didn't know what to do because if I lied, he would know it and then the interview would be terrible. And while I'm going through all this mental gymnastics, out of my mouth comes because I thought you were an asshole. <laughs> and Dave said that he was traumatized by that for five years. <laughs> and I believe him. So, anyway, we became friends, and it, it was cool after that. As a matter of fact, he um, sends me birthday cards, and they're, they're lovely. Uh, they're satin flowers and butterflies and, you know. But uh, he does usually write a lovely, some, you know, a sentiment in script. And, um... Okay. Script is this thing we used to do. <laughs> and it can be really beautiful, and you're never gonna need it. Okay, I'm back. So, but at the bottom of this beautiful card was a P.S. and it said, P.S. my mom always likes Sunny better. <laughs> so I think that he's still harboring. Anyway, so I was 40 and that was a million years ago and I'm not 40 anymore. And uh, I always hate to tell people how old I am because I always wonder if they're clapping because I'm not dead or because I can still get into my costumes. <laughs> and don't turn the light on. I always turn the light on when I say it. Don't turn the light on. I'm 73. I shouldn't, my mom says I shouldn't pay any attention to it, but you know, she's not up here. So, no, she said, if you don't pay any attention to age, age won't pay any attention to you. Bullshit. <laughs> I love you, mom, but no. Okay, so I'm going to go and start this big extravaganza with, <laughs> with the right wigs. And, uh, but I just have one thing that I want to say first, and that is, um, What's your granny doing tonight? to 
The love you give me keeps me hanging on Oh honey
I don't beg. And you know why I don't beg? Because I'm a fucking Oscar winner! <laughs> I'm in love with you. Step out of it! Winner is Cher in Lusa. It finally meant that I was accepted in some area of my work because, you know, I've never really been accepted by singers as a singer, and actors don't think of me as an actor. I've actually succeeded at everything I ever tried, and yet I'm not part of any of the groups. I don't think that this means that I am somebody, but I guess I'm on my way. Thank you.
lots of Hank Williams in our house growing up, and there was also lots of Tito Puente. And my uncle and my mom and my grandfather, they would sit around and play guitars and sing, and we would all sing. And then Elvis came. We watched him on Ed Sullivan, and my mom said, he is so great. She loved his sound. She loved his songs because, you know, they were Southern songs. And I just thought he was amazing. I could relate to him. I think I love the Heartbreak Hotel the best. to Los Angeles, I think at the Pan Pacific Auditorium, I was 11, and I said to my mom, I said, Mom, can we go? Please, can we go? And she said, yeah, that would be fun. Let's go. At some point in the concert, all these screaming teenage girls got up on their chairs and were hysterical. I said to my mom, Mom, can we get up on the top of our chairs and scream too? And she said, sure, let's just get up on top of the chairs and let's scream and yell and jump up and down. He was a rebel, and he did things exactly the way he wanted. It really introduced me into music like I never felt before.
Oh, no.